Our next session is a panel titled Network Automation Showdown, Go versus Python. I'd like to welcome our panelists and moderator for the stage. We have uh, panelists uh, Brandon Bennett, uh, Ryan Hamill, uh, Daniel Hertzberg, uh, Frank Seesink, and uh, Klaus Rugani Tupke. Uh, moderating the panel today is uh, Kat Gorinsky. Uh, Kat is a senior network engineer at a large company and has come to us today from Austin, Texas. Uh, she is a member of the NANOG Board of Directors. Uh, Kat, please start the showdown. Thank you, Jason. Can you all hear me? There we go. Thanks, Jason. Um, I'm going to introduce several panelists for you. Um, I also have an automation background. I work with a lot of Python right now, and I'm very interested in Go, which is what started the idea for this. Um, after I was talking to Dan a bunch at, at Autocon. So I'm hoping that we can all educate you on the pros and cons of both. If you're new to programming, then this will help you figure out which one you want to start with. If you're already a seasoned programmer and consider making a switch, hopefully we can give you some insights there as well. And then we'll also have a bunch of time at the end for questions and answers to probe the minds of these excellent panelists. All right. Disclaimer, they all wrote their own bios, so I take no, no fault for any of that. <laughs> All right, Brandon Bennett is a C software engineer at Roblox, concentrating on build, building network automation tools and systems. He has been in the networking space for 20 years, with the past 10 years having focused on software and automation, including startups and at Meta. He has been programming and scripting in Python for a long time and has been using Go since 1.0, including spearheading a lot of the adopt of Go at Meta. And Brandon is right over there. Okay. Then we've got Ryan. Ryan is a network engineer for i3d.net, a Ubisoft company. He uses Python to automate pipelines, monitor and configure large EVPN fabrics, and troubleshoot customer-facing issues. On his off time, he is slowly getting his feet wet with Go and understanding the capabilities of Go routines. And then next we've got Dan Hertzberg. Dan is a technical marketing engineer at Arista Networks. He works in the space of automating network deployments, as well as the realm of observability and analytics with streaming. Dan has been in the networking industry for over a dozen of years, where he has always had one foot in the door of networking and another in development. He has worked with Go for over the past five years, including Kubernetes operations, telegraph integration, Terraform providers, and many more. Then over here to my left, we've got Frank Seesink. Frank is a senile network engineer. <laughs> he wrote it, not me. <laughs> at UNC Chapel Hill. Prior to this, he worked at a state REN for over 20 years. Beyond network support duties, he is part of a homegrown DevOps group bringing automation to bear using Python and Django, Go, Kubernetes, and more. A bit of a jack of all trades, formerly he has a BS in CS and all coursework for a master's. He has a love of most things digital, including programming languages dating back to first coding in BASIC on a Commodore PET 1000 when he was 12. He has been involved in network automation and its current form since around 2017 when he first started using Ansible helped create the Internet to Network Automation SIG, which he continues to co-hosting, and he is constantly learning. And then last but certainly not least, we have Klaus Topka, who is a product developer and founder of Telco Manager. He has worked with large network service providers such as Telstra, NBN Australia, NZ Telecom, AWS Australia, AWS US, and Embertel. He has also worked in conjunction with large network technology corporations such as Nokia, Amazon, Juniper, and Cisco. He has been able to experience different job titles passing through fields such as network engineering, network performance, product development, and software engineering. His experience with network automation has led to the construction of several products and systems for different companies. And he's also worked on network performance for his master's thesis and wrote a book about service providers. And I actually found Klaus because he's written a book about network automation with Go and Python. So, all right, we've got a few slides here to get us started on some basics before we switch into full questions. All right. So we're going to cover the pros and cons. We'll talk about what each language excels at, what each language struggles with. We'll talk about some modules and libraries that exist for network purposes, and then who should consider using each one and why. So a really quick high-level comparison um, for Python, the ecosystem has a lot of special libraries. Uh, the learning curve for Python is more intuitive for the average beginner, and it is a dynamically typed um, code, so it streamlines the coding process for those getting started. Go, on the other hand, is a compiled nature, so it simplifies deployments since it's all packaged up and compiled. Um, concurrency, it has a great performance at scale if you're running a large um, concurrent parallel projects. It is statically typed, so it's more predictable with upfront declarations. And it has, uh, for error handling, a more proactive approach for better resilience. And then I linked at the bottom of the page for those of you following on slides, a page that had some more references comparing the two. 
And I believe this is uh, for me. Believe so, so we'll talk about static versus type and interpreted versus compiled. I think most people in generally networking are going to be within the Python realm. So we'll kind of start with dynamic typing. Dynamic typing essentially is more or less when you initiate a variable in something like Python, let's say a equal 5, b equal 5. Dynamic typing makes it the point where you don't have to specify what a or b are. You just kind of add them together. Static typing is a little bit different. So in static typing, like within Golang, a equal 5, b equal 5, you also have to initiate the fact that a and b are going to be integers or u integers or in 16s or <laughs> all, all the various different integers that Golang offers uh, to its developers. Now basically in static typing, everything has to have a type. It absolutely has to, otherwise it's um, not usable effectively. Uh, interpreted language. So Python, for example, is an interpreted language. You kind of go in and type in uh, your various code, and then once you, let's say, call a function, for example, it has to read line by line by line and then execute said function. Compiled language, which is uh, what Go is, effectively what you do is you take your code and you compile it down to machine code so you could further on run it on uh, your given operating system. Cool. All right. Okay, so let's talk about uh, concurrency and parallelism. I'm going to stand up because I feel weird talking. <laughs> okay, so that topic is a little bit uh, tricky. So I'm going to put it in a few words, the difference between concurrency and parallelism. Lots of network engineers and people that start programming and they get confused about that. It's basically concurrency is dealing with lots of things at the same time. And parallelism is doing doing lots of things at the same time. So it's dealing with things and doing things. A true difference here. So there is a good definition on some microsystem which you try the programming. If you search, you're not going to find it because now it's Oracle. So if you search multi-thread programming, concurrency, and parallelism in Oracle, you're going to see the whole definition. There's a link also on the bottom of the slide. Oh, the link is there. So that's so. What we're going to talk here a little bit is uh, it's important to understand that concurrency, you're going to um, basically share something, right? So it means that if you have only one network interface, whatever is your code, you're going to send packets concurrently, right? Because there's only one interface. The same with CPU. If you have only one CPU, you're going to run concurrently your, your, your tasks, right? So in the early days, like when you have only one CPU, only one core, you have lots of devices like keyboard, mouse, and video, and everything. The CPU had to do all of those things concurrently. They didn't do par in parallel. As the video com com becomes a little bit more complicated, they created a GPU. So we, now we can have things running in parallel, which is the video processing and the other things done by the CPU. So the thing is, uh, the the concurrency in parallelism, have, it's two different concepts, but it's very important to understand so you can code properly. And in Python and in Go, you can do both. But in Python, it's much more complicated and you're probably going to get wrong. In Go, it's just simple. You just write Go and the function you want to, and then it's Go to the runtime. And the runtime, you're going to decide if it's going to run in parallel or it's going to go, it's going to run in uh, concurrently. It depends on if you're sharing memory, how you actually do those things. So it, you might have to share something, then you're going to have to run in con concurrently. So you're going to have locks or mutex actually to do that. Uh, in Python, you, you, the most uh, common implementation is CPython, which use um, global interpreted lock. Why we do have that? Because of memory management. Uh, Python uses reference counting for allocating and deallocating memory. When you create objects or variables, you, you create a reference number. And that re reference number, when it goes to zero, he frees the memory. The problem is that it's shared with everything. And it means that you cannot run two threads, because the def definition of the thread is that you share memory or you share the context with your, uh, with your task. So you have two tasks that share the same memory. If you have two process, you have two different contexts. So you can run in parallel process in, in, in Python, but you cannot run two tasks in parallel in Python. Means that the threading 
the threading module in Python is useless unless you have uh, what we call I.O. bound uh, tasks. What's the difference between CPU bound and I.O. bound? It's that one, you require processing in memory, or CPU, right? You have to calculate things. In the other one, you require the I.O., like sending packets to the network. So if you have, like, let's say we want to write a probe that sends pings package to 1,000 nodes, and those 1,000 nodes are going to answer in around, let's say, 10 milliseconds. If you send all of them in parallel, you're going to get, let, if you can send in parallel, you're going to take 10 milliseconds to come back with the answer, right? But in, in Python, you won't be able to send that in parallel unless you use uh, multiprocessing. That's going to create 1,000 process. You're not gonna, you cannot be able to do that in Python. It's going to be super slow and consume lots of memory. So then you have a SyncIO, which is, um, is, the, is one of the modules that you can run coroutines. And then you will be able to send 1,000 packets concurrently. Because 10 milliseconds is a huge time for the comparing to the process of CPU processing time. But when you go slower, like a cross network, you have a really, really a small uh, uh, return, like milliseconds or nanoseconds, then things get complicated. And Go would be much better to implement on those environments. So that's the difference between, I don't know if I miss anything. Um, so that's it. That's the difference between Go and the, the most used um, implementation is the Python. Um, tomorrow we're going to talk more about that, but yeah. that's it. Thank you. Over to you, thank oh. your performance talk. All right. So I'm going to stand as well, though I don't know which is going to make me less nervous. <laughs> so uh, and apologies in advance. to I've had this slide, this, this graphic, for over seven years, and it really spoke to me, and I, I really wanted it in the slide deck for a reason. So this discussion is about Go versus Python, specifically in relation to network automation. And this slide, or this, this graphic, for me, represents something that to always focus on if you're developing, whichever language you choose. Um, if you look, they, what they did is they took an example of a single CPU cycle or an L1 cache. If you would calculate that as taking a second of time, then doing an internet connection from San Francisco to New York City, just a, a single connection, would be the equivalent of over a year. Now, the point of that graphic is when you're writing network automation tools, the vast majority of the time, your software is bored. It's sitting there. It's, it's wait, it, it, the processor can do an awful lot, but you're waiting for these network connections. So in relation to his discussion on concurrency and parallelism, this is one of the areas where Go will demonstrate an advantage when you leverage it. It built in. It has this ability to do these Go routines. With Python, you have to take that effort. All I was wanting to make a point of with this is whichever language you choose, if you're doing network automation, especially the larger the scale, I strongly encourage you to learn how to use threads in one form or another, either the threads library, concurrent futures, or async IO in the case of Python, or with Go, you pretty much just get it with the Go routines. But you want to focus on that because that will really optimize and speed up your, your network automation tools. Um, those who do things like standard for loops and just connect to one device at a time, I mean, I've seen code that could take 11 hours, where if you learn to leverage this, you can drop it to 30 seconds. So it's just one of those things I really wanted to make a point of. But that's pretty much it. I'm going to go over to Brandon for easy yeah. versus simple. So I, I think one of the, the key things when comparing the two languages is that uh, they're both taking approaches to make things easier on the programmer. However, there is this, this concept of easy versus simple, where Python is easy. Um, but Go is simple. Um, and there, there's a lot of different examples of this once you start learning the languages. Um, so in, in Python, you end up using dictionaries a lot, um, putting, putting dictionaries together. There's things like list comprehension and dictionary comprehension, which allows you to make really expressive like filtering um, uh, expressions um, to uh, to do stuff. So there's an example here on the slide. Um, errors are automatically handled or are, are exceptions, and those exceptions are bubbled up in the background. You have to put try accept loops to actually catch those errors. So all this stuff makes it for a very easy language to, to approach and get into. Uh, Go kind of takes a very different um, 
a different approach to this. So uh, in, in Go, we, we preferred using structured data as much as possible. So we actually define our structures up front, define those types. Um, we probably won't use you know, a, a grab bag of dictionaries um, because it is a strongly typed language. Um, you won't find anything like dictionary or list comprehension. Um, oftentimes, you just write a, a, a for loop. Um, for example, if you wanted to filter something or mutate from strings to integers or integers to strings, you would just actually write a for loop and append to a new, to a new um, what we call slices or a, a new list. Um, and so people that are newer to Go actually find that it's very, um, you end up writing a lot more code. Uh, a really great example of this is uh, if, error, or, uh, if error equals nil, which is a really common um, idiom in Go. Uh, every single error must be checked at where it can happen. So if you do a function call and that function call can error, that function will return an error and you have to explicitly uh, check that error. And it, it's, it's newer to the language, this drives people absolutely batshit crazy. Um, and they're like, why do I have to type these, this line over and over and over again? But the thing is, is it prints error handling up front. So you go, okay, uh, this function returns an error. Okay, what should I do with that error? So if it is something that needs to be retried, I need to retry it. Uh, if it's something that I can safely ignore, I can ignore it. Or if it's something that's important, I'll return that error from this function further up so something else can handle it. Uh, and this, this concept of, of doing this type of error handling um, really allows you to, to think about all those conditions. Uh, where I find myself in Python a lot forgetting about these, these conditions and then sometime um, you know, much later after it's in production, uh, somebody goes, hey, I, you know, there's, there's this weird, scary error on my screen, what happened? And it's like, oh yeah, I should have put a retry there because there is a, a network I.O. condition or something like that. So um, go, go, you end up writing a lot more lines of code. Uh, if you get paid for that, for the number of lines of code you write, write and go. Um, <laughs> but there, there is definitely a different approach there. It, just to add to that, the, the error interface is incredibly easy. So it's literally three lines of code. It's uh, type error in a capital letter, and then it's uh, interface, and then literally under that it's um, think error as a string, but it has to return a value, which is very, very simplistic just to add to the simplicity of it. Right, right. Uh, the error type itself, you can easily just pass around. So it, um, yeah, it, it is very simple. I think it's very tricky. Like if you are not following the structure of the errors, you can get really lost you like you get an error on your program you don't know where is it mm. in python it's much easier because you have tracebacks and and it's like if you want to deal with errors python would be bad it's just because it's easier like go you have to follow the structure if you don't follow the structure like because sometimes you have to append the error to all the functions that call the other one and you have to put something there that informs that comes from that function mm. And I've, I've, I touched lots of code they, they didn't do right. So you get the error there and where is this? <laughs> so you have to modify the whole code to, to see where is this error. So Yeah, most, most functions also to return a type and an error. So you're going to, like Brandon was saying, like you're going to see so many things that trip a lot of people up in Go when they first learn it is that typically you see like a value comma value where like a value is something you care about and other one's an error. Or it would be, you know, value, comma, error. And basically what that means is you're returning two values. One's typically going to be the thing you want. The other one's going to be error. And if there is no error at all, it's nil, typically, just to kind of throw that out there. All right, for this next slide, we're going to go to Ryan and Dan to tag team on deployments and dependencies and libraries. So with Python, we have plenty of toolchain-based uh, helpers. I'm sure it, the seasoned developer may use poetry. There's a, you have virtual environments, or was it PVENB? Um, so, and then there's comes to uh, Jupyter Notebooks. If you're uh, trying to uh, kind of do a proof of concept or like showing graphs and things, it's kind of like um, MATLAB in some way. You're showing uh, graphs, 3D graphs and whatnot. Um, on the REPL side of things, the read eval print loop that is more commonly seen in the Python interpreter. If you just type Python and just plain run the interpreter and you're 
import libraries and you're executing your code, that is that's that kind of loop. Uh, for requirements, that kind of goes hand in hand with uh, virtual environments in a way that uh, if you don't want to run amok inside your system uh, when you have to install many packages or you know to make your script work, which can be like net ADDR or uh, scrappily things like that, but you don't want to, like I said, you don't want to pollute the system. You can contain that within your virtual environment, and you, so you, when you run your program, you load your environment in, and then you run your script on top of that. Uh, Go wise, I'm probably going to be like a walking, talking Go advertisement at this point. Just going to talk about how great it is. Uh, but these couple bullet points really drive home a lot about Go. So Go is a compiled language, so there's no external dependencies for it. So effectively, like when you do it, kind of compile your Go code, like you're not relying on whatever is on the system for external libraries. It's compiled, it's good to go, and it's also cross-compiled too. So kind of like, what does that mean? You could be on a Windows machine and you can cross-compile it to Linux. You could be on architecture 64-bit and, and compile for 32-bit. A lot of times, um, most people who work a lot heavily with Go leverage something called Go Releaser. And Go Releaser is a GitHub action, and it allows you to effectively release your code and also get like releases per architecture. Most people have probably even downloaded Go binaries without even realizing it. So most uh, binaries out there that are within GitHub that might say like uh, binary name dash arm, binary name dash Darwin, and so on and so forth. Typically, those are I mean obviously they're going to be compiled languages. Most of them, you know, being Go, like Terraform, for example. Uh, Cross compiling, we ran into that. Um, the built-in unit testing is great. So anyone who's done unit testing in Go, it's, it's very good because there's no domain-specific language within it. Like, you don't have to go out there and get some third-party tool or platform or modules. You kind of just write the code you know and love, uh, which is Go, um, <laughs> in these little Go unit tests. But obviously, your unit tests are only as good as the tests that you, as a developer, uh, write. But there's, there's no external frameworks you have to get to do this, which is really awesome. The formatting is great because you could effectively just go into something like uh, Vim, like NeoVim, if you're super hardcore 10x dev, like use Vim all the time. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, you can go into Vim, kind of like handcraft some code that you want to, throw around some uh, Golang, and then at the end of it, you could just do what's called a Go Fumpt. And Go Fumpt is effectively Go Format. So it just formats it in the way you want to. So you don't have to worry about any tabs or spaces or Things being generally like syntactically out of order, which is great because you don't have to get any type of um, integration to maybe like GitHub Actions or something you would typically do with other languages, which is really good. And lastly is typing. So once you work with a type language, it's in my opinion, it's very hard to go back to something like Python. And the way typing works effectively is that when you initialize a variable within Go, so let's say you initialize a variable to a struct or a, or a struct, let's use that example. And inside that struct, it's going to have access to all these different methods. So you can just kind of type in their variable, dot, 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 and you're going to find things that you, you, <laughs> you don't even know about, like that are like brand new to you as a developer. You're like, oh, this is really cool. Like, like things that, that you wouldn't imagine that are there that are actually going to be there and might be totally useful to you, to where you know, if it was something like Python, you'd actually have to go and dig in the class and the actual code. Um, so yeah, I think typing is great. I think all these things about Go make it a very good language for for network people. So in Python, there are many libraries to achieve a function or a task in one form or another. Uh, there's with NetMiko, uh, it's actually its underlying libraries is Paramiko, uh, primarily for SSH, but it does have Telnet functionality. Uh, for more frameworks, we have uh, Nornir and Napalm, and for separate libraries, we have the PyGNMI. And uh, if you're calculating uh, subnet mass, ciders, things like that, uh, net ADR is a very good uh, utility to have. I'll also add to this list, because uh, I'm an async IO user, I use uh, Scraply, Scrap, especially Scraply uh, NetConf, and I combine that with async SSH, async IO all on top of that, because uh, I'm the one that works on, if I'm working on a device, I'm usually working on like 10 or more at the same time, and I like keeping the async IO loop busy, um, and kind of go from there. All right, more uh, more Go stuff here. So, yeah, kicking off with uh, Scraply. There's also a Scraply Go 
uh, Go module, which is great. So most of the things that you're going to find, like within Python, you could do them in Go. It's just um, you're going to find a lot of people move from Python to Go for obvious reasons that you know, we've highlighted. But as far as Go goes, no, no pun intended, um, Monday there was a really good talk. Uh, Rob Shear from Google came in and talked about a lot of the open config, uh, kind of where it's going in the past 10 years, kind of looking to the future type of thing. And everything was really um, related to all these projects. There's a couple more, but these are kind of the ones that I, I, I've used in the past. So why got YGNMI, GRuby, GNMI, GoYang, GGG? <laughs> um, all these projects are heavily Go related. So if you want to work with anything in the open config kind of community, or generally anything with open config, I mean, you can use some Python. Like most of these things are gRPC based, which is why they use a lot of Go. You can compile most of the gRPC based things in the Python, but it's, you're not going to get the um, same level of experience, Brandon. I think you've done some Python within. Yes. Um, Within Go, or I'm sorry, Python within Open Config still, right? Oh, me? Yes. Oh, <laughs> I, I've never done the the Python. I've, I've only used um, Open Config with with Go. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. I thought sorry, Python right. crazy. Um, Go BGP, which is a really good BGP daemon. You could write um, BGP controllers with with Go if you wanted to, and uh, kind of spin up dynamic neighbors, that sort of thing. Uh, Net Adder. I think most people have used Net Adder within Python. The same thing is available to you in Go. So you could do things like validate whether something's a valid v4 address, validate whether something's a valid v6 address, maybe you get the next uh, given IP address, that sort of thing. And then lastly, Prometheus. Um, you could do Prometheus exporters with Python, that is true, but um, natively and also has helpers for Go. So you can create very easy uh, Prometheus, Prometheus exporters within Go. Uh, also, quick shout out, I, I have written a Go netconf library, so if anybody's interested, don't use the one off of Juniper. I also wrote that one. Um, <laughs> it was my first Go project, and it's crap. Um, uh, so. There's also one that I, actually at the same time, I don't know why they put it in the other room. They are talking about Genoi, which is not included here, but it's bigger. Yeah, it's the one that it's uh, people are talking about now. You can just write pings and trace routes directly using Genoi. So, oh, G G N O I. Genoi. Oh, yeah, yeah, G yeah, the talk is going on right uh, concurrently, no pun intended as well, um, with us, you know, I, It's a parallel presentation. Okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's something I'd, I'd suggest everyone check out, like GNOI. Like, that's something that's not, that doesn't get mentioned very often. Like, Klaus is saying, like, you could, do, I think the talk is upgrading with GNOI, and that's a good use case for this because it's all Go based. Like, the, um, most of the clients that are out there are in Go. So you could effectively, programmatically, multi vendor do a code upgrade across anything just through code, which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. Same thing goes with ping, traceroute, file rotation, BGP, health Z. There's a whole bunch of really interesting services for GNOI. Oh, you think? Again. So, uh, so we're discussing Go versus Python. And I, I, I tried to find a visual way to represent something that, you know, when people are doing development, you have to think about what are your priorities. So, I mean, I don't know if anybody here would differ on this opinion, but you know, you, you very often are trying to choose between how fast can I develop it and how fast is it going to execute. And this is sort of a very overgeneralized visual way of representing it. So, I mean, you want optimal execution time, then you're looking at having to write an assembler. All things being equal, if all developers are good at what they do, um, the fastest code will be code that's written in native assembler, but it will also take the most amount of time because it's just you're going to be at such a low level. Now, from there, you have C, which is the foundation of the modern world as we know it, because the C Python interpreter, the Ruby interpreter, the Perl interpreter, you name it, they're all written in C. Um, the original version of Go was written in C until it got rewritten in Go. Mm -hmm. um, and today, we're not going to talk about it, but Rust has come along, and in my opinion, slots in right around where C's at. Um, Python is famously known for, you can very rapidly slap something together, right? I use it all the time when I'm trying to pull information out of uh, equipment. And when what matters is I need that information and I need it now, then absolutely use Python. If execution time matters, if you're writing something that's going to run for the long term, um, if you don't care how long it takes, well, then that's not a decision part of your process. But if execution time does matter, again, this is my sort of representation of it. I think Go hits the sweet spot in that it will let you code at about 80, this is my, my view, about 80% of the time it takes, or 80% of the efficiency it takes to write in Python. You can definitely do most things faster in Python development-wise, 
um, you'll take a slight time penalty to do it in Go, but when you finally actually run it, the Go code is going to outperform the Python code by a large factor. It's almost like 80% on one end, 80% on the other. You get sort of the sweet spot of the two. Um, and that's basically what this graph is meant to represent. So, uh, Frank, will you choose the, the points of that, that beautiful picture? What's that? Like, do you, do you I just go close that. to Python? <laughs> I think he was biased there. You can see, like, goes really close to Python. <laughs> well, for development time, I think, I, you know, yeah, I, you know, it's, uh, but it, 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 it's, it's fine. Hand, like, it's hand drawn, so, you know, it is not at scale. I should probably put a comment there. So, yeah, lots of time is very, is very about, you know, personal, personal feeling of which language you're going to feel better writing, right? And that is, it, it's good and bad. It's good because, uh, you're gonna feel comfortable, but it's bad because um, you might not be learning something new, right? Or something that is better, like Frank said. <laughs> right, so that that covers our slides. Um, we're gonna do a couple of questions um, that we've pre pre written out, and then we're gonna open it for for some Q and A after that. Um, so for our first question, I want to ask all of our panelists um, is if you were teaching a programming class to novices, what language would you pick and why? We can just start this way and walk our way down. <laughs> so, the, the, to, I, I guess we'd have to define what like a novice is. I think for people here um, who are computer literate, I guess um, I, I would I would not shy away from teaching somebody Go. Um, I think it's a, a great language. Um, it also kind of sits on that that edge of okay, it's garbage collected. You don't have to worry about your heap. You don't have to worry about um, allocating and deallocating memory and all this stuff, but it is still has pointers and it still has stuff that teaches you low level um, concepts, which I think are really beneficial. Um, so I'd probably choose Go. So I'm going to have the differing opinion and I would say Python because of the fact that you can spin up a hello world right within the interpreter, but you simply, if you already have the package installed or you have it installed in Windows, uh, you can just fire up the interpreter and you can literally type print and open uh, parentheses, uh, quote, you know, hello world, clo uh, close quote, close the parentheses, hit enter, and you get your hello world right there. Uh, and then you just have your building blocks on top of that where you have very, you introduce your variables and functions, and then uh, it also with Python, it kind of enforces, I think, a little cleanliness. I know some people don't necessarily like that, but it keeps things in order with either, you know, enforcing uh, an equal amount of uh, tabs and spaces. Uh, and that's kind of, and then, uh, of course, you have the uh, ecosystem for getting packages and using them, and it's, everything's all there. I think just easier to use. <laughs> Yeah, so most answers, my answers for these things are going to be Go, but I kind of would go the other direction and um, I would pick Python. And there's nothing wrong with Python, like it has specific use cases in networking, uh, especially. But the reason why I picked Python is because like, it would kind of allow you to do every anti-pattern and, and still work. And the, <laughs> the reason why I say that is you could import like 100 libraries into one piece of code. You can initialize 200 variables. You could for loop among loops among and, and not even use things and it wouldn't matter. Uh, I think the thing is you would teach underlying like fundamentals. I, th I think that's what really matters uh, for, for most people. I will point out if you use Flake 8, it'll yell at you and tell you to get rid of all that stuff you're importing and not using. Well, you need, you need, bo you need both ones. That's, that's yeah, the You other teach part. people to, to lit their stuff later, so yeah. yeah right. It's very easy to import things you think you're going to use and then not use them. That's where linters are very good. So in the context of Go versus Python, if I was trying, uh, my answer is going to be it depends. For a novice. Um, for a novice, if the goal is to quick, get them quickly up to speed on the fundamental, very simple fundamentals, I would choose Python, I'll be honest. Being that I taught programming when I was in college as a grad student, uh, if I was going to teach a comp sci introductory course, I would absolutely choose Go. Uh, not only because I think it will be far more educational in the long run, but it also is better for me as the person who has to grade stuff because that compiler, uh, this is the same thing if you've ever, when you first learned languages, you want something to give you feedback. Python will let you step on yourself a little bit uh, being a dynamic language, whereas Go will help you by telling you, no, 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 you tried to set age to somebody's name. That doesn't work. Mm -hmm. um, in that context, I think it would be more helpful for a novice to learn. Uh, that's a tough question. 
<laughs> Reminds me when I was studying engineering, um, my teacher actually preferred to teach me Pascal instead of C. And it's kind of similar, I think, to Python and, and Go. And I had lunch with uh, someone and this person didn't know about anything about programming, but he said, oh, my child is studying in university, my, my daughter, and is learning Python. <laughs> So Python is more popular, I think, in universities as well. I think it's the reason it's easier to, to pick up and learn the, base goals, uh, the basics first, right? Maybe go, if you want to go a little bit further, you go go. So I will go Python first. All right, for our next one, I want to ask you all for some examples of programs you've written and why did you pick Go versus Python for that? program. We'll go the other way now. So you can start as close. It's a little bit echo here. Can you repeat? Yeah. <laughs> so I would like some examples of programs you've like written in, and why did you pick Go versus Python uh, sure. for that program? So one or two programs. Okay. So if you want to write an API to answer quickly, you don't choose Python at all because Python is not for that. So you want to like, let's say uh, you want to write a um, HTTP uh, WebSocket for your front-end application. You're not going to use Python. It's going to be super slow and it's going to be painful. So you just write HTTP. HTTP in Go, it's, it's faster than in Rust. So you can, I, if I'm going to write backend APIs, Go. There's no other option. It's going to run much faster, better. So if you're doing some network automation and you need to provide an API, there's no other way to go. <laughs> Uh, I'm actually going to straddle the fence. For one project, I used Python and Django because that's what our DevOps group uses, and that's a factor, right, if you're working with a team. Um, and for sort of web front end sort of stuff, it was that. Um, I also wrote a utility that the intention was to have it be able to run on all the major OSs because I wanted a troubleshooting tool that we could give to users. And for that, I wrote it in Go very specifically because, again, no external dependencies, which is huge. And being able to just send somebody a single file and be like, oh, run that, um, and then give me the output. Um, so for that, I absolutely used Go. Yeah, you don't have problems after the run RPM updates, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, for me, it, it, due to um, the nature of what I work with, which is typically OpenConfig and Kubernetes, I just side with Go. 90% of the time. I mean, I think for most people, it just depends on really what you're working with. So uh, I think most people are getting into this whole LLM, AI, ML buzzword space. And most of those things are within in Python. You you know work with things like on Kaggle and Hugging Face and so forth and, and Jupyter Notebooks. Like, you're just going to use Python. I don't think there's any way around it. This is what everyone's using. But I'd say um, mostly I prefer Go just because of it's what I know. I, I love the language itself. And also, too, it depends um, on what I work with. It, I think that has more to do with it. So for me, uh, and a good example for me, I, for again, Python, I wrote a Slack bot named Polly that would interface with the network at a previous employer that would log in and support many devices from Extreme, Juniper, Cisco IOS, Cisco Small Business, Mikrotix, and more. Um, it would also interface with Wi-Fi controllers, bandwidth shapers. It, it had to access a lot of systems. And it was something that I needed to get up and running fairly quickly. And I needed it to scale and hit like 80 devices within like 20 seconds kind of a thing. So I chose that because it was more about meeting deadlines, uh, just trying to get the project out the door. And uh, it's basically, it's just uh, making using the, what's the word, uh, interfaces, the ABC in Python to abstract and make things a more coherent interface when I'm having to work with so many different uh, CLI types, NatConf, you know, every system's different in some form. Even uh, SOAP and trying to make that work in Python, that's fun. Um, so it, 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 it was a challenge in some ways, but it was, you know, when I had that out the door and I could actually give the team, the engineering, give, sorry, give the engineering team the, their time back from doing tedious tasks on requests of provisioning and project management and that kind of stuff. Uh, it, you know, it empowers them to get what they need and get their job, sorry, their job done faster. Yeah, I'll, I've got two examples and I'll try to go quickly here. Um, so the 
The recent example is all of our collections, all of our telemetry uh, for, for collecting devices at Roblox is done in Go. Uh, part of it is because of the GNMI ecosystem. Um, part of it is, you know, there's uh, thousands of devices and it's easy to, uh, for the concurrency reasons, it's very easy to just have one collector collect a whole bunch of stuff or having one parser parse all the information that comes out of that. Um, another example I have uh, was when I was at Meta, and I've actually done a talk on this before uh, with a system that we called Bending Machine, uh, which was a horrible name for something that does uh, uh, life cycle management of devices. The workflow side, we wrote in Go so that it would do all the retries and be this you know, fully distributed system that was automatically, you know, could, could encounter any, any problems. However, the actual code that interacted with the devices was all in Python, and we actually just shelled out from Go to run these Python scripts and then came back in. <laughs> and the, the reason was is because everybody else in the network in engineering organization knew Python. I didn't have to teach them that, and it would run that. It, it would actually run any language, but everything was written in Python. So it kinda, that's an example of both. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, I believe we have about 15 minutes left of time, so I'm going to open the floor to questions if we have <coughs> If not, I do have more questions for the panelists. But please come on up if you have some questions or if there's any on the uh, remote attendees. We'll take some of those right now. I see Lee coming up and I also see Michael over there. The best question gets a gift. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the moderator for the remote questions. Uh, Blake Willis from Zayo. Question, is the panel aware of any low-code, no-code frameworks that work well in network automation and observability ecosystems? Who wants to do that? I mean, observability, I think GNMIC has really done amazing work. Like, I think even during this conference, I've talked to several people about how good GNMIC is for observability. Um, most people use it for just the testing framework to say, hey, does this path work? Is that path work over GNMI? But what most people are missing out on is like that can also feed into pub sub buses. It can feed into time series databases. You can graph all these things and, and do uh, closed loop automation and all kinds of alerting, which is uh, very phenomenal. Yes. Yeah, I, I guess the only other comment on that is just um, the low code, no code. Um, I've seen some, some a, lot, a lot of it revolves around like an Excel spreadsheet that's a little bit different, right? Mm -hmm. um, and there, there's kind of a trap that there's no such thing as like no code uh, and low code. Um, yeah. Sometimes you just got to like roll up your sleeves and, and write code. That's my, that's the way I prefer it, but I also get paid for that. I'll go over here to Lee. Lee Howard, IPv4.global by Hilco Stream Bank. Um, favorite tutorial for either language? Ooh. Which, uh, which one do you pick? Either, <laughs> your choice. No, you have to choose one. <laughs> <laughs> So, so no on Go's website, on both at the same time, they don't run in parallel. <laughs> <laughs> on, on Go's website, there is actually a I can't remember the name of it right now. Um, like a Go, a, a quick Go tutorial that kind of. I might have that uh, Did we talk about telemetry? I, I didn't hear. Uh, did we talk about telemetry? No. Uh, for my for my example before, yeah. yeah. No, I'm, I'm I'm talking new resources here because. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, right now, the question was for favorite tutorial okay, for sure. the language. Oh. So. That's so. a pretty good start, yeah. Yeah, so that's in the resources at the end of the slides. That is from the Go website. So, any other favorite tutorials that you guys have for someone who's just starting in Python or Go? I don't know about favorite, but for those who have access to LinkedIn Learning, um, I like my background in Go is relatively recent. I, I basically was doing most of my work in Django and Python, and a couple of years ago, I got in a rut. And so my solution, being the genius that I am, is to go learn another language, right. you know? Like you um, do. But, but it gives you perspective. And I just, because of my university has access to LinkedIn Learning, I use that. Yep. And I will say the, the courses they have on there are pretty decent if you're looking, if that's the way you learn well, is through video type courses. Yeah. It's pretty addictive. I went to Rust now, so. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Where, Chris? Hi, uh, Chris Woodfield, i3d.net. Uh, Brendan, your mention of uh, Go, Go code shelling out to Python um, made me twitch a little bit. <laughs> um, it breaks the microservices paradigm where everything should communicate over API channels of some sort. Um, and then I remembered you know, the shell is, in fact, an API. <laughs> it's a wild and woolly one at times, but it's a perfectly acceptable one. I'm, I am curious why you took that 
route as opposed to creating a gRPC channel or a REST service as a front end for the Python? Was it just simpler and quick and dirtier? Yeah. Yeah, it was also just like more direct. Like we could control, when you have a process, you can know exactly what happens. We can catch exceptions, et cetera. You, you kind of mentioned, um, we kind of, if you look at like gRPC or some of these other network um, transport protocols, right? Standard error, standard in, standard uh, out are just text pipes. So the input to all these uh, Python programs was a JSON blob that would be shipped over standard in. Um, it would write commands out to standard out and then logging to standard error. So we were essentially writing, like it's a microservice platform, but we were also controlling the execution of that, that Python. So we, we allowed sandboxing, right? So we could sandbox Python into its little, little realm, uh, make sure that it's not doing something that we didn't want it to do. Um, and then, you know, we could have hosted that on yeah, a remote server, like a serverless type platform, if you're thinking of like AWS Lambda. And in fact, it was somewhat inspired by AWS Lambda, um, but we just didn't host it remotely. Um, it was just, you know, shelling out. Um, and it, it worked really, really well because we could control it. We could kill it. We could, you know, do different things with it because it was under full control of, of the Go program. Okay, thank you. So we may have somebody else coming up to the lead. Andrew Peterson from Calix, you made an interesting statement about Go not having external dependencies. Uh, really? Looking at you, libc, glibc. Runtime dependencies. Yeah. I don't Very think fun. that was a, uh, a current. <laughs> <laughs> I, All right. I send you my Python code. You need to install these modules. You don't do it, it's not going to work. Yeah, Fair enough. With the Go code, it just works. Fair enough. Yeah, I, 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 think I, I, I think, think you the, won the gift, right? What's that? <laughs> That's the t-shirt, right? He well, pointed out, you, well, you got the t-shirt. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, I'll say, you know, I, I, I write little utilities that might run on CentOS back to seven up to, you know, current Ubuntu or whatever, right? Um, talk maybe a little bit about some of what you mentioned about packaging, right? To make life easier with that. Yeah. There, there's this common thing, especially in networking, but it you know also works in software engineering, which is works on my machine, close <laughs> ticket, right? <laughs> um, that that I think that's the point we want to make with those the, the the dependencies is the fact that once you give somebody a binary, which you were, you were talking about before, it's the same binary. It's not going to magically change. When you give somebody a Python script, it's what version of Python are you running? Mm -hmm. What are your third-party dependencies? Did you create a virtual environment? Did you not? I run into these daily with the Python stuff that mm -hmm. we currently have. And it, it takes a lot of on-call support time to debug somebody's laptop. Callahan, if you're here, you know, we, we've done yeah. that before. <laughs> yeah, you know. fair enough, thanks. Mm -hmm. Another remote question for me, Michael? Yes, another remote question from John Carson in upstate New York. He asks, what is it like learning Python as you started out on the basic and true basic languages? Have you started basic? So I learned basic when I was like six or seven. So I'm trying, I'm trying to kind of think back. Um, I think Python and basic kind of have a shared heritage a little bit in that like, you know, they're, they're meant to just like get started and get out there where, where Go, it's like, oh, you have to learn what a compiler is. You got to learn, uh, there's like yeah. a linker or something that's going on. Yeah. A lot of that stuff is hidden from you, but with, with an interpreted language, like, like basic and, and Python, I think there, there's some similarities there and I think they're easy to get into. I think Python is the spiritual successor to, to basic. The idea you go line by line is something really useful for someone that's learning so mm -hmm. you know exactly what's going on now you know what's the values of your what things are running at the moment and go you, you don't have that so yeah i do also want to point out um we do have a golang tutorial at four o'clock four o'clock four o'clock yes. that they're gonna be doing and then tomorrow you've got a tutorial on go python and rust rust yes um so for those you're the new kids on the block the deep dive we definitely have some additional talks following after this one um, is there any other questions before I pull up on our, our list of questions? All right, we're going to go back to our list. All right. I would like to hear what is something that you like and loathe about programming in Python and Go? So, 
favorite thing and least favorite thing about the language. And let's go this way and then that way. So change it up. <laughs> so Danny can start. I can start? Okay. So things I hate about Go, um, generally speaking, if you don't have a type for something, you're in a war, you're not in a war for a hurt. It's just like kind of rough. Like if you have to do what's called casting or type assertion within Go, it, it becomes like really complicated. Um, I'd say that's probably biggest pain point I could think about with Go. What you know, overuse of uh, map string interface is another one. Um, Python. Um, ugh. <laughs> I, I just I don't write that much Python to really be angry about any situations with like I mean it just m most stuff I do is pretty common common things and I my daily driver I guess is, is really Go so I can't really comment on that. Okay, so something that I don't particularly like about Go and it's coming this is me coming from Python going back into more a C type or compiled language is the fact that I have to uh, be very strict on marshalling and unmarshalling uh, uh, data structures, which could be XML, JSON, YAML, et cetera. Uh, so having to define that all the way out. Uh, or you can abuse it, the type system and just say everything's an interface, right. map of interfaces, if you really want to do that. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's unfortunate you could do that, but yeah. <laughs> so there's that. Um, but then on the uh, the Python side, something that I also don't like about it is that when it comes to like async IO and trying to like manage and get effective use of all the CPU cores is the fact that I have to, you know, make a bunch of processes that basically run off their own separate code, which then start an async IO loop, then I start my code after that. Instead of a go routine, I can kind of just fire and forget and let the job scheduler do everything, steal work between the CPUs, do whatever it needs to do to keep itself happy. Um, the one thing I do like about Python is uh, it enforces cleanliness, <laughs> the formatting, you know, trying to uh, make code readable. <laughs> um, it doesn't sometimes carry over into Jinja templates, <laughs> uh, but that's a different subject entirely. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I love. I guess like I'll I'll do the Python Go stuff together. Uh, what I hate in Python is the fact that I'm bad at typing variable names, um, and I find those at runtime. In Go, my favorite thing is I find those at compile time. It, I uh, I remember the first time when I actually wrote some Go code and it worked the first time and I, um, after it compiled, and I was like, oh, I'm actually not a bad programmer. I'm just a bad typist. <laughs> um, the thing I don't like about Go is I really want a sum type. I really want to be able to more expressly say, I would like this type, this type, or this type. I would like a Cisco, a Juniper, or a Arista as, as a thing. You can somewhat express this in interfaces, but sometimes a more concrete type would be uh, very nice, and I, I kind of miss that. This way? Okay. Um, I work across multiple machines, and that brings its own little quirks to it. But uh, for Python, I'd have to say it's the remembering which virtual environment I'm in yeah. because I switch between projects. So you have to remember, deactivate, activate. You get a, you know, are you in the right one? Oh wait, those modules haven't been updated over here. I gotta do an, an update. Um, so it's well intended, it's an awesome feature, but you have to remember that. And it, sometimes I, I get lost in it. Uh, on the Go side, I can't say I've done enough of it to really give much, there's nothing that really jumps out at me as like I really don't like it. Um, I guess one minor thing I've run into, it's a feature that I think is awesome, the defer option. You know, when you when you open files in Python, if you use with, uh, there's, there's a mechanism there. In the Go world, you open a file and then you right away do a defer so that you're telling it when you get to the end, close this file for me. So I don't have to remember it. I love that feature. But the one thing you do have to kind of keep tabs on is the defer is a stack, right? It's gonna push those Whatever, whatever you're closing, it, it's pushed onto a stack and it has to unravel the same way, so you better make sure your code is written nice and clean, which you should do, but. And then we'll finish yeah, that. so for me, Python, um, easier to, to do proof of concept, it's faster. Um, what the thing is that really annoys me in Python is dependencies, uh, mm -hmm. terrible. Uh, like, especially if you are adding packages from another system, like you have pip, pip3, 
you have um, other tools that adds problem like a apt and you have snap depending how you add those dependencies uh, it's a nightmare mm -hmm. In Go, you don't have that, so it's, it's really quick. And the thing that I like, I hate in Go, is error, error handling. I don't like it. Because the thing is, you have to write the context to pass to the other functions. And if you don't do that properly, you're going to forget. So I wrote a code three years ago, and then got an error, and I see I didn't propagate properly. And then there's no, <laughs> there's no uh, properly you know, comments on that, so I got lost. So I don't like your handling in Go. We are out of time. Uh, if you have additional questions, I believe most of us are here for the whole entire conference. Um, there, all of us are also on the Network Automation Forum Slack, and I believe most of you guys joined Discord, maybe? Mm -hmm. If not, I'll get them all on Discord for you, too. So look for us around the conference, or look for us online on one of the various chat platforms, and we're all happy to answer more questions and come to dance tutorial and classes tutorial tomorrow. So thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you.